Hi friends, host Eric here. I was talking with FanDuel. If you thought the adventure was over, you thought wrong. Okay, so I was starting to get a little bit of a vibe that uh, people thought something had set me off or got me mad to make that video or something. No. No, I'm not triggered. I don't trigger, okay? I'm trigger free. I have no like of, tolerance for, willingness to hang out with the Lone Ranger's horse. Why? Because the Lone Ranger's horse was named Trigger. That's why. I, I'm just, I ain't down with that. Homie don't play that as the immortal Homie the Clown once said on some television show. So, if you play that, then you differ in that regard from homie. No, I'm not triggered. I'm the opposite of triggered. I'm de-triggered. I'm, I'm triggerless. I've been... I've had a trigectomy. I've had a triggerectomy. I've had all my triggers removed and replaced with non-triggers. What are non-triggers? Well, they include switches, buttons, um, levers, and other not-trigger things, you know, obviously. Seems like kind of a silly question, what's a non-trigger? Everything that's not a trigger, obviously. I <laughs> listen to mom. Are you triggered? Did I trigger you? Are we, are we playing trigger tag? Remember phone tag, for instance, Mom? There was a game people used to play when we had landlines. You'd call, we'd message on the machine, then they'd call you back, we'd message on your machine, then you'd call back, we'd message on their machine. Well, um, I'd like to play trigger tag. I'll trigger you, then you trigger me, then I'll trigger you by triggering me, and then we'll both ride bareback on trigger. Bone Ranger's horse. Don't I figure a bigger trigger is in the stars for me? Yes, I do. I made a poo just like that giant poo tree. Hey, you triggered me. Don't trigger me. Okay? I'm very, very triggerable. And when triggered, um, that means you just assaulted me. Every time I feel triggered, somebody's guilty of assault. Okay? Um, probably with their words, true. But that's just as bad. Making me feel bad, no matter how you do it or what you say, is the same thing as stabbing me with a knife. True statements. True statements all around this morning. Today we're working the truth angle. Hey Winston's mom. I heard a rumor that you're into truth. Would you like to snort a line of this truth with me? <laughs> you want to hit off this truth pipe? Yeah, well. It's like, cloud, 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 cloud. Just, if you just listen to that video and try to give it a little bit of a chance, maybe you'd hear what I was saying a little bit. But of course, that requires DI. It's like the whole C.S. Joseph thing. What can that boil down to? That guy is a knower and an interfacer. So... What does he never do? He never asks questions. When first I encountered that question on Quora, it said, you know, what can I ask to be, do to be more productive? I thought, well, I need to ask the following questions first before I can answer that question. It's a, it's a get function. It's a TI get tool function. Of course, you've got a knowledge function. You don't ask any questions. If you've got a TE interface function, all you need is clarity about what the problem is. And that can be whatever you want it to be, frankly. So, you know, he says, 
I want well, advice be more productive well whatever CSJS defines more productive as that's what it is and there's no need to know anything about the context <laughs> but you know it's also a non-universal knower a universal knower might very well recognize that there are universal knowledge considerations that trump the locutionary or what exactly is said by the person in Quora you've got four kinds of flavored powdered creamer to try because well you know we use regular kind of powdered creamer we don't use any flavor we use original flavor which is just flavored like coffee creamer I don't know it is kind of sweet in a way it's not really like sugary sweet but it makes it kind of softer it just makes the coffee soft it, it's kind of like having a water softener uh, for your shower or something it's a coffee softener like if you've ever had to drink like the bottom of an old pot of coffee that was been sitting there for a while and it's like really just like thick just so bitter it is currently 5.51 in the morning, 5.51 in the a.m., and uh, I'm out here at the soccer field, as you can see. I'm planning on playing some soccer after I pull these ball rips. I was hoping to get you guys to play, play some soccer with me. Uh, but, you know, if you think that's a little too European, I get it. That's fine. We could... Uh, we can do this instead. Maybe like this. Yeah. I like that one better. We could do that. We could have this guy over here. Maybe. And maybe we could have... Let's see what that is. There we go. We have this guy over here. There we go. Well, now we've got some nice colorful pictures in the background. My head's in the middle. It almost looks like I know what I'm doing around here. It's amazing. It's like, hey, who taught the crazy guy how to use a green screen? <laughs> no one. No one taught me. It's just like Winston's mom was just like, I hear the green screen. And I was just like, I got to figure out how you are. You know? Uh, okay, cool. So now that we have that set up, let's begin to discuss the important matters of the day. My camera's not 240B, 240p. It's not the greatest camera in the world, but I think it's 720 at least. Uh, thank you, Utter Self. Um, they're both uh, Renoir's. Renoir drew those pictures. You may remember him from such other pictures as Famous Renoir picture number one and Famous Renoir picture number two. Um, actually, I think the one on the right might be a... Uh, what's his name? Um, well, I mean, I know it looks a lot like a Van Gogh, but it's, it's, I'm pretty sure it's not. Uh, I think it might be a Da Vinci. Yeah, I've got a Da Vinci there on the right. This this one here is a Da Vinci. That one there is a Renoir. They're working on the plumbing in your home. Did you clog the toilet by flushing a Renoir down the toilet? The guitar is basically playing itself. Congratulations. Pipe renovations for the whole condominium. See, lawnmower's got good reason to be proud. He knows that not everyone has the kind of turds 
that can ruin an entire condominium's plumbing. But he does. And he carries himself like a man who knows it. Isn't that right, Lawnmower? You're known as um, Buffalo Turd around the uh, around the condominium because the size of the turds are are famous for destroying any conventional plumbing. Well, you've had to have massive culverts put in instead of regular pipes. Uh, thanks, the Gen X, Gen X seal. Yeah, me too. Sometimes, you know, when things are going well. It, it's kind of like the biorhythm reading you can really trust. Turd rhythms. Uh, when life's going well, I got big, firm turds. They're ideally one-piecers. I think my turd softness uh, varies in keeping with my ontological firmness. So if I'm ontologically firm, then I have nice, solid poops. And if I'm feeling ontologically soft, then my poops soften accordingly. Um... Oh, this is a green screen that Winston's mom bought me. And uh, I like it a lot. I, I didn't know I was going to like it that much. You know, because I'm not really into visuals. <laughs> like, I, I, I don't... I mean, when I watch a video, I don't care what it looks like. I'm just listening to it, really. I, I don't really watch videos as much as I listen to them. On YouTube, anyway. I mean, obviously, if I'm watching a feature film or something... Speaking of which, Rachel and I watched another just stunning movie. I'd seen it a long time ago. I saw it in the theater when it came out. And I'm going to give this one a 9.9. .9. I originally was going to give it a 10, but I found one little teeny problem and I gave it a 9.9. .9. Um, and that movie is Being John Malkovich. Weird question, but where is INTP host Zachary? Uh, he comes around every once in a while. He shows up, stops in, and says hi, and updates me about his life a little bit, but uh, he's not actively affiliated with the channel anymore. Like, not on a regular basis. How does a green screen work, exactly? I always kind of wondered that, too, right? Um, when I looked up how I was going to make it work, I figured I'd have to find some special software or something. But it actually works with OBS, and in the process of figuring out how to do OBS, I opened up I had to figure out how to make the, the color filter in um, OBS. I opened up all kinds of things you can do in OBS that I'd never tried doing before because I never had any compelling reason to learn anything about it, you know. So now that I understand OBS in general, I can do all kinds of things with this software that is uh, that are facilitated dramatically by the green screen. But, um, you know, uh, the reason... They're facilitated dramatically by the green screen is because while I could put these, you know, it's like, let's say I didn't have the filter on. Let me show you what it would look like. Let's say I didn't have the filter on. Get rid of this filter. Yes. And there's my green screen, okay? Now, I could still, if I wanted to, put an image up here like this and move it around so it's not over my head or whatever. So it's like this sort of thing that is something I didn't ever bother trying to learn how to do before um, that I'm now able to do because I had to learn how to use the green screen which taught me how to mess with stuff in the sources and scenes thing in the OBS, basically. So, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where uh, being an ENTP means avoiding TE until it's your NE is excited enough to justify it, right? So then when I put back the filter here, what it does is it basically replaces uh, it replaces um, the green with just transparency and 
and move this around a little bit like that there you go and I could go like that there you go and then now we're back to this thing again you know because instead of showing green it shows transparency there underneath the trend underneath the video thing so in the video feed all the green parts are um, made transparent so then the images that I have underneath the green parts look like my background because everything that's green disappears see what I'm saying <laughs> that's how it works <laughs> anyway I like it it's fun it's um I don't always like put it this way I I'm it's, it's fun enough that I want to make it such that I can always leave the green screen up right here and that means I'm gonna have to reorganize my room basically or our room here we have all our clothes back here behind this green screen so I'm going to turn it down and yeah, yeah. well I've sort of done some of that so I have a light here I don't it should be like this more but I, I was being kind of lazy about it um, and I have two lights shining on the green screen now I'm not expert at it at all by any stretch of the imagination I get the concept the point is you got to get rid of all the shadow basically and um, I'll probably never have the cleanest screen screen mechanics you know <laughs> but I did look into the lighting I understand you're supposed to have lighting at your feet and then light the green screen behind you <coughs> <coughs> one thing I did that helped this work a little bit better is I moved the green screen over the couch so uh, before I had the green screen behind the couch which meant it was harder to get rid of the shadows there's the couch with the with this over the couch it's easier to get rid of the shadows that was a uh, aha moment for me this evening it was like aha <laughs> we can put the green screen over the couch you know, for me, small TE successes are moments of celebration. I, I have low expectations for myself in that area, so when I when I do something efficient, I pat myself on the back. So I was struck today by when we <coughs> <coughs> yeah you could send me pics to put in the background if you want <coughs> yeah my uh, <coughs> email drive I'd prefer to receive them shared on Google Photos but um, I'll, I'll take them you know if you want to send them in an email that's fine too uh, I'll probably use them yeah why not <laughs> that'd be cool uh, so anyway what was that talking about I forgot I forgot what I was talking about oh I know so I had this really strong visceral response to that movie before sunrise because it was so much FI data right and Rachel had kind of an equivalent response to this uh, one character, especially in being John Malkovich. She was constantly using everybody and sort of telling everybody that your worth is contingent on your utility. And um, Rachel was so angry at this character at the end of the movie. I think that, you know, if we could identify movies that have strong vibes associated with cognitive function values you know you possible test for FI polar would be watch this movie and I'll just watch you watch it you know watch before sunrise I'll just watch you watch it and see can you comfortably sit there and watch it is it driving you insane um, it, I mean it was so visceral a response I had to that movie and so visceral a response that Rachel had to the um, Maxine character in um, being John Malkovich 
and both those things clearly correlate with our polars. Rachel, the notion that anybody be defined by their utility is anathema to her. It's odd. It, she's she hates to eat so much. <laughs> you know, practical considerations? That's immoral. I temporarily worked at the toilet unit in a store. Is a knock at enter people's hotel rooms. That sounds like the beginning of a penthouse forum story. Anyway, a hot young co-ed said, come in. I walked in. She wasn't wearing anything. John Malkovich? Being John Malkovich is the name of the movie. Being John Malkovich is one of the best movies I've ever seen. Along with, before Sunrise, they just haven't sort of come in close, close proximity to each other, but it's not like I'm in a mood to be giving out top awards all of a sudden. It's just, I happen to see these two, you know? Um, being John Malkovich is one of the cleverest, most interesting, and fun movies I've ever seen. And also, as Rachel pointed out, I didn't notice it until the end, until, well, until she said something. It doesn't really have any likable characters in it, which is really hard for a movie to to keep your enthusiasm if it doesn't have any likable characters. You didn't like the ending? Well, I gave it a 9.9, .9, not a 10. I, there are a couple of little teeny things that bothered me. Um, change the background? Sure, I'll change the background. Um, for example, uh, one thing that bothered me was there's no explanation of why um, of why it would be the case that the old man waits until John Malkovich is 44 to go into him, right? And he says, when the vessel is ripe. But if he had to wait till the vessel was ripe, then why is it the case that, that um, the character played by uh, John Cusack was able to get into him before then and take over, you know? There. We use this one. Oh, yeah. That's a beautiful lady. Look at her beauty. I'll put another one over beside over here, so. Uh, let's see. Oh, beautiful lady. I'll just put this like so that just so you can see. Oops. Undo that. Go back. I don't want to move the whole thing. Just this one. Joy. Yeah, just like that. I'll move this one a little bit. Like this. there now we can move this one over a little further so there we go perfect now we're cooking with gas now we are there you go I changed the, the I drew these pictures actually I'm not a good drawer but um, I like drawing I have a lot of pictures that I've drawn they're all just random nonsense like this you know every I, I've learned a long time ago that I don't have a very good sense of colors. <laughs> like, for example, Cameron one time sat down and showed me and Rachel about using his markers that he has. And he explained, I was like, you know, we have so many different shades of green and gray. And he's like, well, you have to. I'm like, well, why? And then he showed me, like, drawing a building and using the different shades of gray to make the uh, the bricks in the building look like they're in shadow and stuff, right? I was like, oh, see, I would have colored in each one of those squares with as different a color as I could find from the one next to it. You know, that's my strategy for color choosing. <laughs> which one didn't I use recently? Which one's most, you know, which one's underrepresented in this picture? Like, Oh, it's got a lot of orange. I should put some blue, you know. 
like that. I'm starving to death. I gotta get a uh, a coffee cake. Hopefully they'll tide me over for a little while. Hmm. Well, here's what I like about drawing. When I'm drawing, I have no expectations, pressures, anything. Um, I, I don't consider myself a drawer at all, really. As I don't, it's not part of my identity, you know. I certainly don't consider myself a good drawer, and I, I don't really have any opinion about my pictures when I'm done, um, except to say like. Oh, this one's, this one's cool, I guess. You know, like, some of them I think maybe are more cool than others a little bit. But basically, I just think, I don't think anything about it. I just, I just put it, put it in the stack of things that I've done, you know. Um, because, it's kind of, um, it's kind of like a relief function almost. Because, it's any physical aspect. And I don't expect any to be to do anything important in the physical realm. I, I just, you know, it's like I understand how I can use it in the physical realm, but as far as I'm concerned, it, it just isn't suitable for that, right? Like here's another picture I drew. called sunlight is lovely you see sunlight is lovely I want to stress these pictures are not psychedelic these pictures reflect somebody who has no idea how to draw pictures and doesn't try to draw that doesn't <laughs> doesn't know at any given moment what he's trying to draw or have really a clear sense of what would make it better or worse. My aesthetics regarding visual stuff are pretty poor. I don't have good intuition about about how to make things look like me. You know? Here's another picture of mine. What is it? I don't know. It just came out like that. It's just a guy with a thing on his head that looks like a, I guess a dog. He's got flowers growing out of his forehead. I don't know. Who knows why I draw these pictures? It's basically because I'm sitting someplace and I don't have to, um, I don't have to, I just have to use my ears. So it's like if I'm listening to uh, the Dodger game on the radio or something, that's perk time to draw a picture. I can listen to the game, I can draw a picture, I can do both things concurrently, and uh, neither of them suffers. If I'm talking on the phone, I'll draw pictures. My mom always used to do that too. When she was talking on the phone, she'd always doodle. Sometimes I'll just sit and draw a picture, and that's the only activity I'm doing. If I feel like that, you know? But, um... You know, some of them come out, I guess, better than others. But that's just my opinion about them against each other. As far as I can tell, and as far as I believe, you compare my pictures against people who are good picture drawers, then 
You recognize them for as with they are kind of strange, but um, not good. <laughs> strange, but not good. That would be the name of my my art. Uh, my artist showing at the gallery, right? Come to my show. Strange but not good. A uh, a bunch of random pictures I drew. We have so many pictures, but they're all over there somewhere. I don't know. When I'm working in debate, I draw a lot of pictures. So if I'm uh, if I'm judging a debate round and it's PF, and I've already flowed the case in the rebuttal, um, or if the kids are slow, or if I it's like I've judged this topic a million times, they're all running the same argument. So it's just like like after you've judged a given topic a bunch of times and you watch around, like on the nuclear weapons topic, I just would write down. <coughs> Okay, one, um, pack, P-A-K, two, miscalc, three, because there's these blocks that everybody runs. India, Pakistan was a common block. Miscalc was a common block. AI was a common block. So my flows, which if I, they had been, if I had been hearing these arguments new at all, which would have been quite extensive because I would have to write all the, down all the warrants and shit. You hear all these arguments a million times and you just, at the, at, by the end of the tournament, you just go... Okay, I'm hearing the the India pack block again. Um, I just write down pack. If um, if I hear some unique warrant that I've not heard before, I'll make a note of it. Uh, why was India and Pakistan a block? It was considered basically. It was saying it, it's a strategy. So um, it's like with the topic, what it was, which was uh, nations ought to eliminate the nuclear arsenals. Um, one way to attack the problem is to try to create a tipping point moment and say, now's the tipping point. If we don't add, take this affirmation now, India and Pakistan will escalate to nuclear war. What was What's interesting about this topic was when I was a kid, we debated, um, you know, debated various topics. Uh, nuclear war was always an impact, and in general, public discourse about nuclear stuff, nuclear war, nuclear weapons, was much more pessimistic when I was a kid than it is now. As the decades have passed, the initial almost certainty of a, a large number of scientists and thinkers that atomic weapons would prove to be the end of humanity, the thinking now is with the philosophers who say, you've got to understand the nature of agency and what this does to the people. What nuclear weapons do to people is they eliminate a lot of reasons that one might, in theory, go to war. Uh, most, almost every single war that one can imagine going to is eliminated by the inclusion of a nuclear weapon on either side. So, you know, it's, it's counterintuitive but weird, at least true, that somehow, in the course of bumbling our way through the eons, humanity worked its way up to the nuclear bomb. Something that almost anybody, talking about it in advance of its occurrence, would conclude was the beginning of the end of humanity. The fact is, it's been the most powerful peace-inducing technology man's ever created. It makes warrior cultures moot, deprecated. It's impossible to sustain a warrior culture when no amount of bravery, no skill with any weapon or anything is remotely relevant once people start decide to take the war seriously, basically. You know that no matter what you're doing, if you're fighting in a world where there are nuclear weapons, you are either um, fighting a skirmish 
and with the certainty that you're not going to let it escalate to nuclear weapons, or you are particularly fighting around the nuclear weapons, which is to say you're only attacking people if you have the nuclear weapons and they don't, or if you both don't. No, one more, nuclear bombs are not, are not a hoax. Um, if, and, and there's lots of reasons to, to believe that, but I would simply point out, if you believe in nuclear power, if you think some energy does come out of those nuclear power plants, then that should get you wondering why a nuclear bomb is not possible. There certainly is a lot of energy to be released through this process, obviously, since it's producing power plants, and since it's in power plants producing energy. If you think the power plants are hoaxes, too, um, I mean, what about Three Mile Island? Is that a hoax? <laughs> I don't know. At that point, it starts getting a little bit unbelievable, right? Uh, okay, so um, his influence ever is not delusional. Look for it. Who are you talking about? Uh, poops a lot, Bear. He's not that influential. Sure, he poops a lot, but um, I don't know. Okay, Ga sounds like something Caveman Ugg orders from the concession rock during Flint Tool concert. He is trying to impress his date. Sheena was voted pretty skipper in the cave last month. Of course, she didn't have much competition. It was her, a saber tooth tiger, and two Neanderthals. She was a shoe in. Um, any thoughts on the Libertarian Party? Yeah, I think that they're. I think that. I think they're entirely a mistake. To position libertarianism as a style of policy is to do it a disservice in some sense, but also the libertarians have the same problem every other group has. They aren't interested in doing an honest calculation that includes um, how their own frame needs to be sacrificed sometimes. So your libertarians are not are either going to be so-called moderate libertarians who aren't libertarians, which just means they're they're not as statist as your average politicians or they're going to be real libertarians who are who are not going to budge on anything they're going to be Dr. No like Ron Paul was in the in the Congress or something what's underlying all the problems in American politics is ultimately not that the wrong people are winning but that it's adversarial rather than dialectical and people aren't having real conversations about substantive issues. Ron Paul wanted to vote as though we were starting from scratch and deciding what the government should be. He was not being practical in his thinking at all about his job as a legislator in the country as it was and how to move it in certain directions or actually address problems he was only interested in constraining the government and that's the thing about libertarians constraining the government is important but the government is not our enemy this is a citizen democracy, and governments do things. They are empowered to do things. They have a monopoly on use of force. We cannot live in an imaginary world where principle 
rules all, and the practical concerns of a nation should be ignored entirely. That's not true. And the fact is, we don't come into a job in government with a blank slate. We come in with a lot of crap already built up, right? And a lot of things reliant on those built up piles of crap. If I, as I've made this analogy before, if I throw a bunch of trash in the ocean, that's a bad thing. And we should get it out of the ocean right away. If I throw a bunch of trash in the ocean and let it sit there for 20 years and a coral reef grows up on it, it's still a bad thing that I threw a bunch of trash in the ocean. But it is not advisable for us to pull that trash out at that point because stuff's growing up on it and has is now reliant on it. Well, we have to be careful regarding existing stuff in the government. Libertarians are going to want to go into office and tear everything down. And the last thing the country needs right now is another person imposing a singular ideology or alternately their own subjective um, weak ass N.I. like Trump is, you know. <coughs> I mean, N.I. may be an objective function. <coughs> but that's only in the sense that it it references the universal. If you've got a weak ass fourth slot N.I., you will apply it in a most subjective fa fashion if you're an ESFP. Your F.I. will decide whether or not you want it to be true. Your N.I. will check it for some sort of holistic truth. I mean, your N.I. will receive that it is holistically true, I guess, because, of course, if you're really terrible at telling what comprises a whole that's complete, then, you know, anything's, anything's today's truth. And it could be anything's today's epiphany. Anything's today's new miracle idea that's going to change everything, you know? Everything's today's, um, I mean, like, like, Take Trump. He comes into office. He's made these promises on the campaign trail. He follows through on them. He does exactly what he said he was going to do. So, in that sense, it's also like everything's subjective. I don't need to look at the actual world, see if any of the data has changed. I don't need to evaluate any of the decisions I made previously to make sure they're still active or current. I just go with my subjective FI and my weak NI. And that's it. Well, you know, we need somebody who has, who's not approaching it wrong. Would a libertarian approach it wrong? Yes. A libertarian is going to approach it wrong because they have an agenda. It's called libertarianism. Is a Republican, Republican going to approach it wrong? Yes. They have an agenda. It's called conservatism and being part of the Republican Party. Is a Democrat going to approach it wrong? Yes, they have an agenda. Is any candidate, except uh, except somebody who meets an extraordinary number of very very precise criterial excluders, who pass by, who successfully passes through that, well, they're not going to be the right person, because we don't need again another agenda person who's there to make winners and losers amongst the agenda people. Um, as president, if you're obsessed with issue A, B, C, D, E, say you got five of them, good chance you'll be happy with me on two and unhappy with me on two and indifferent on one. Why? Because unless you are yourself fully meta rational and non agenda e then you're probably not going to be right about everything now you might say well Eric you're probably not going to be right about everything either well I'm not going to be right in all my predictions not all my strategies are going to work I'm not going to achieve all the outcomes I'd like to and I may even uh, provide make a wrong decision based on some justifications that I should have let stand shouldn't have let stand that last one's very unlikely but it could happen if there are arguments I haven't heard and haven't thought of before that are determinate on an issue that turns out to be um, an issue where I vote the other way. Keeping in mind, 
you can count on me to be constrained in general to not let the government or the law or this special interest group or that special interest group or these people with that agenda or those people with this agenda impose their agenda on you whatever it is I, I, that is part of my agenda is no more agenda imposing no more teams we are all adult Americans and we can have a real conversation about this it's not that difficult we don't have to yell at each other I've been guilty of that you YouTubers have helped me to to overcome that somewhat I'm I'm learning you know in part I didn't trust myself I, I I didn't I mean I didn't trust everybody I didn't trust I didn't trust America I didn't want to have to engage them and be disappointed you know that no matter how reasonable I am no matter how honest I am I can't get through to them because um, they're determined to be ideological well you know that's part of the leadership mantle if you're gonna to try to run for president then you better learn to be comfortable with actual leadership actual leadership doesn't spend a lot of attention on me on my being comfortable I would be more comfortable obviously if if I could get people to come around to my side of my, my understanding of things quickly and especially if it would be super nice if I could convince people to come around to my understanding of things by yelling at them that would be so convenient <laughs> oh you mean yelling at you works wow look how many supporters I have all of a sudden <laughs> well unfortunately yelling at people in general doesn't convince them that you're right I mean, my agenda is to is correctest, which means I am not going in with an overarching frame that will define how I approach the government. I am going in with a robust set of constraints, though. So you needn't worry that I'm resorting to specious process arguments that offer you no guarantees. Quite to the contrary, I'm offering you guarantees where there ought to be guarantees, and I'm not offering you much in the way of indication of what I'm going to do, about things that I ought not to. Certain sort of policy decisions rely on dynamic forces that change in the moment. I cannot know in advance how I'm going to deal with China and Taiwan until I begin dealing with them. That's a legitimate process argument. If you ask Trump a question like that, he would say, well, we're gonna get the, we're gonna get the best people to do it. That's a process response, right? Don't worry about how we're gonna do it. I'll just put the right person in the right job and it'll be done fine. Okay, well, this is politics, though, so <laughs> you should be giving some indication of, of what your policy is going to look like, uh, what sort of um, outcomes you want. I can certainly do that. But the thing is, there is a legitimate area where for a person to claim a uh, process argu argument, basically saying, I can only give you so much information about this because I'll have to see how it plays out and what's... What's the resistance? Where's the resistance? And that'll give me some information about the strategy to solve it, you know? And then there are other things in which, uh, if I were to give a process argument, it would be misleading, specious, dishonest. If I were to say, uh, well, you know, I don't have to figure out, you know, what, how I'll vote on an abortion thing. It really, it really depends, blah, 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 blah. I'll tell you right out that I don't think the federal government has any business establishing a legal status for abortion one way or the other it's a state's rights issue that if there's a federal bill abortion bill crosses my desk uh i will probably vote no on it regardless of what it says because it's not the jurisdiction of the federal government i now it's possible that somebody could write a bill related to abortion that was so carefully worded and so perfectly done that I didn't think it violated the jurisdiction of the federal government but in order for it to do that it would have to do almost nothing it would have to be something like um, abortion rights celebration day or something which I would vote no on obviously <laughs> or pro-life celebration day which I would also vote no on now if for some reason I had to vote on I, mean, I had to either sign or veto let's say I know a veto is going to be overridden so uh, I'd rather make the decision to either sign it or veto it rather than say 
uh, just despio it or something. Um, and it were a uh, abortion rights protecting bill, I would certainly veto it. If it were a abortion rights restricting bill, um, and I and I knew they were going to override my veto anyway, I would probably support it on the grounds that it's not going to impact the outcome, and I do I, it might be something that I would. I mean, I still don't think it's the federal government's purview, but the Supreme Court has ruled otherwise. So, uh, you know, I, if I were going to be a legislator, I might vote for that. Uh, would I sign it? Uh, if I felt as though the veto were going to be overridden, sure, I'd sign it. But if I didn't feel like my veto were going to be overridden, I probably would not sign it because I just desk veto it. Because I wouldn't want to encourage this misconception that the legislator ought to be doing business that is not part of the federal government's jurisdictional purview. And the only way I have as president to discourage them from doing that is to simply ignore anything they send me that's not legitimate in terms of jurisdictional matters. Well, I'd rather go in a train... I don't want to go on a plane, really. Uh, trains are... I might get a little motion sick. I'm very motion sick prone. We're, whatever we do, I'll probably have to drive myself. I'd be the driver. I can't ride in cars, usually. It makes me motion sick. I, I do get very much... No no roller coasters, no... Yes. I can go on boats, on lakes. No problem, that's fine. I can go on horses. That's fine. <laughs> I can go horseback. That's what I'll do. We'll campaign the country on horseback. So, look. Here's the deal. My point is this. If you are a voter and you're looking for a candidate to vote for, your habit, possibly, or even probably, is to look for candidates who seem to be passionately supporting the positions you think are important on issues you think are important. What I'm saying is if you care about those issues and any other issue, you're best served to have a competent professional who understands how a president might take action on a given thing and frame it. No matter what you think about abortion, you might be happy with my states' rights approach. In other words, if you're in California, you'll get what you want. You'll get abortion. If you're in Kansas, you'll get what you want. You, you know abortion. So, as voters, regardless of which side of the issue you're on, since my job as president is to concern myself with the appropriate, just, and public-serving job of the federal government's executive, um, you can rely on me to defer that matter to you. Oh, lawnmower. I wish you would have told me that before Trigger and I had that very special ride. Ants. Ants, you guys aren't allowed here. I thought I would have made that clear. I told the ants the other day, I said, hey, ants, listen. Become a little bit bold in your house yesterday. I said, uh, I didn't want you to stay here. Can you please go back to your outside house? And uh, you didn't you didn't say anything, so I assumed that meant yes. You're still here. That's a little concerning. Here you go, trouble. The thing is, as a candidate for president, I'm going to 
ask people to hear non-divisive approaches to things. So I'm going to be asking them to do one of the hardest things they've ever done in their life, which is to give up this blame thing that allows them to feel as though they have some control or some sense of why and how the world works the way it does. But that blame thing where the reason things are so bad is because other people don't see things like you see things. It prevents any real conversations. It makes it such that you don't just want to get what you want. You want the other guy to lose too. So if we're talking about abortion, I'm hopeful that I can convince the country to understand the value of taking a non-divisive approach that's legitimate, sustainable argumentationally, and meaningfully addresses the problem, but that doesn't let either side win. So if the country's going to turn around, if I'm going to get elected, I'm going to have to convince people to let go of the need to see their imagined enemies lose. Um, to be okay with the fact that usually the issues that we have a clear position on and feel so very strongly about when they're rendered into public policy are much more complicated and nuanced matters and there's a lot of parsing to be done I'm not a homosexual but I uh, I strongly encourage people to uh, pursue you know exercise their autonomy it's not my concern or what sort of sex you like to have I would also say that it's entirely irrelevant what sort of sex I have as to this question about whether I should be a president. However, for those of you who want to know, I am a heterosexual who is prone towards fairly boring, straightforward sex. Now, I'm not... The one thing you should know about my sex life and so forth that is relevant is I'm not susceptible to any sort of extortion, blackmail, or tempting with women. So I'm addicted to long-term relationships, you could say. I'm very much in love with Rachel. I'm not a cheater, and uh, I hate dating, and I find casual sex very awkward. So um, there's no way anybody's going to and trap me into some sort of uh, inappropriate behavior. There's no way you're going to ever hear any sort of ethics investigation. I'm never going to say, I did not have sex with that woman <laughs> because nobody's even going to bother asking me because it's going to be so obvious that I don't do that kind of shit. You know? I don't even want to have sex in the Oval Office. Um, it's a workplace. <laughs> it's a workplace for the President of the United States. It's not a place for Eric to go, woohoo, look what I can do now. I have sex on the Oval Office. I take the job seriously, for God's sakes. It's funny that it's like, by default, I think at this point, we're all like, there's nobody who's honest, who would be an honest public servant, who affords the job, it's the dignity it's due, and exercises it appropriately. You know, well, more that's not true. Yes, there's this big movement towards diversity and stuff, but those people who are so, so, um, 
am passionate about identity politics and stuff, if I can have a real conversation with them, they'll see that I'm on their side. I'm on the side of the individual. Of course, the fact that I'm on their side means I'm going to oppose their pet coercion project, but I'm going to protect them against everybody else's pet coercion project, too. So, um, it's just a matter of, of, of turning these things. So, let's say I'm talking to a group of transgender people, and I have to argue that my point, which, of course, I'm not going to ever mis be misrepresent my position. My position is that um, pronoun usages, different pronouns than he or she or whatever, are ridiculous and divisive and bad. But if I just give them my conclusion right away, they're going to boo me and not listen to me. However, if I approach it like this, it's a different story. Like you, like everybody here, I am a proud and strong proponent of each human being owning their own perceptions and being able to claim as they see fit by those perceptions their honest understanding of their identity. That means I support the right of every transgendered individual to perceive themselves as whichever gender they wish and to call themselves by whichever pronoun they wish and so too of course I'm equally in defense of every individual's ownership of their own pronouns since that represents perception. So you can't ask a person to lie and call you by a pronoun because that's part of their perception. So what works for you works for the other side too. It's beautiful. We don't have to fight about this. Transgender people, we're on the same page. We both agree that nobody should tell you what your perceptions are. We can talk about facts. We can talk about external data points and stuff but identity is a matter of perception so you are absolutely within your rights to perceive yourself as a woman or something in between and it would be and I know that because you value this right you would never ask another person to, to lie to you about their own perceptions which they own so if I perceive you as a woman and use the pronoun she or he or she or her that's be, if it's consistent with my perceptions, then to do otherwise would be to lie. And because just as I would never ask you to lie about who you are to yourself or to me, I know you'd never ask me to lie about who I am. And how I perceive the outside world is part of who I am. You know? <clears throat> so, the thing is, you just have to turn this shit on people. Wrongness is always turnable. And one of the well, I mean, FI may be irrational, but um, here's the other thing is I can do my best to honestly engage directly with a human being. One of the things about irrational FI is if an FI person likes you a lot, it doesn't matter if your positions are consistent with their policies. So I may need to convince people who are rational. I may need to reassure people who are scared. I may need to win friends with people who are making policy decisions with their subjective feelings. Because if they like me a lot, then they'll vote for me. You know? I mean, what I do know is this that even FI people are subjected to perceptual dominance. If you put me side by side with any other candidate, um, the, the perceptual dominance issue will be pretty clear cut immediately. One of these two parties is superior in every way that matters regarding this, this thing that has criteria about it and knows it. And the other one knows it too. Um, that can go a long way to convincing people. A lot of debate rounds are won and lost with perceptual dominance, not necessarily on the flow. One of my strongest arguments will simply be um, asking questions like, well, 
before you made this advocacy, did you consider this? Did you establish this? Did you, you know, a lot of work can be done by just asking questions and answering questions and hammering the same point. You know, like everything that's this dogmatic or ideological, I can turn as the exact sort of divisiveness that I'm the solution to. Everything that, yeah, I mean, I could go down the litany. I can turn everything. Though I had no idea it was so, I have been training my whole life for this. You know, the thing that makes me feel daunted is it, I don't perceive what I'm saying as having any element really at all anymore of hype or trying to convince myself of anything or trying to convince you of anything it's I just don't hear anybody else not that I go out and looking and listening for it true but I just don't hear anybody else getting the whole thing right enough to get it right and it requires a level of maturity that I have to choose to embody I, I, I have to grow up you know it's like I'm selfish. I'm selfish too, and uh, I'm I, I'm scared. It's like I I'm scared of of all the work. Basically, it's how much work it's going to be to to make a serious effort at this. Um, of how consuming it's going to be of my life, and then I'm scared of winning. You know, then I got the biggest responsibility in the world but of course that's part of why it has to be me you know and it's emotional too it's like the sense that you know the you're you're running out of time to to figure things out and there's going to be a window and it'll be a fairly large window I mean it's not going to close fast but there's going to be a window wherein there has to be a launching of a serious committed planned course of action and uh I'm going to have to do it and everything will be different from that point forward. I mean, that's the thing, Freddy Forgiato. I don't think it weighs on people's minds in the way, there's only one way it can weigh on your mind that's appropriate for a president. Some presidents worry about their legacy, it's not appropriate. Some presidents worry about whether they are up to the job. They're not then. Some presidents haven't completed the job of worrying about if they're up to the job and confirmed that they are and never even entered their mind, like Trump. Um, some presidents are extremely up for the job, but mostly because they happened to land in the right time period and weren't very ambitious. So in other words, they they stumble through with an effective an effective presidency and after the fact you go, well, you know, they were suitable like Clinton, but you know, he, he needed to not have to make any big decisions and he didn't have to. NAFTA was the biggest decision he made. I 
that's exactly what I feel like, Lamar. I genuinely believe that if I fail, there's nobody else to do this. It takes, you have to, it has so many pieces have to be in place for one person to possibly handle this shit. And even then, it's an incredible long shot, you know? But the magic of the universe it's reaching a you know, we're in a we're in a period of state change. And I think they're volatile they're in periods of state change. Until a new equilibrium is reached and then things stabilize. What that new equilibrium is gonna be is contingent on the next four or eight years. And it's dependent on a powerfully reasonable vision that's married to no single frame of reference but constrained by all. And that's but also has to be an extrovert. Basically, you can't, you're not going to be, there's like, I'm sure there are plenty of INTPs that I think might, might do a great job as president, potentially, but they lack the extroversion part. They lack the effy, um, at least the ability to, to maintain effy for longer stretches of time as is necessary. They lack the, uh, I'd like to follow through to do all the late work on the campaign trail and stuff, in general, in general. And additionally, I think they're probably more prone to verbosity and, and hard to understandedness than, than me, even. Something I'm going to have to work on. Um, <sighs> so, anyway. Um... 7 in the morning. I'm feeling a little, as they say in French, fatty gay. That means tired in French. Je suis fatty gay. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play you a very, very special Christmas delight. It's nothing to do with Christmas, though. My bad. I got the wrong, uh, the wrong audio thing. I'll fix it. You just, you just hold your horses there. If you have currently let your horses go, please retrieve them and hold them. Okay. If you're a horse, if you're loose, playing fast and loose with your horses, I've asked for please to have good horse management skills around here. If you're not obeying that rule, please cheaty check yourself before you riggedy wreck yourself. Which is always a concern of mine. I justify most of my rules by the fact that you are constantly at risk of really wrecking yourself. Jesus was people but absent of sin. He must then have struggled with regular men. And women, of course, when they too were present, disciples all warily in the lesson. Be 
feelings work would be true. And feelings once spoken would sit where they sing, and we don't know just what to do. For people aren't Jesus once they're betrayed. Pay a terrible cost. I am right handed. I am right handed. Thanks, Lawnmower. This new version, I think, sounds a lot better. Uh, it does sound cleaner. It did speed up. Good noticing. Uh, makes me move a little bit quicker. Thank you for your comments on it. I appreciate it. <clears throat> I'm not done with it. I'm going to... I need to do a couple of little things. I put a G minor in the bridge where when I'm listening to it, it should be a G major. <laughs> it sounds weird. Uh, but I guess, I guess fix that one chord. And then um, I want to put... Uh, I want Rachel's vocals in the chorus. Uh, as the high voice probably instead of mine or possibly in addition to mine uh, she practiced it the other day I wasn't listening to her practice the thing is Rachel can be quite effective as a singer when she's uh, when she knows the song well and has sung it a lot of times and practiced it a fair amount she's not averse to practicing either the other side of the coin is my songs tend to be are hard to sing um, they have like little melodic things that I guess are hard I'm not, I'm not sure why but uh, I mean some of my own songs I, I find some of my heart songs hard to sing like a lot of them have a fairly big range to them you know like Dying Day is a song that I find hard to sing because I have to change registers all the time in it. You know, because, like, the end thing goes in that song now. Because I'm your man, and you're my girl. I mean, my woman in the world. You are the one I will be with till my dying day. It kind of goes like that, you know. And if you're trying to sing up an octave, you have to go shift registers, yada yada yada. Was I in a boy band? I was not in a boy band, but I was in a band with some other boys um, back in, I guess it would be probably like 95, 96 maybe. Uh, I was in a band called Puppy Bus. I was listening to the CD the other day in the car. The problem was we had frankly a terrible kind of a terrible singer it wasn't me uh, 
hey, you know, we're each doing our own thing. I was so happy for Justin. He had a lot of success, and that was, you know, no hard feelings for me. I, uh, I'm i a team player. I wanted to see us all succeed. Justin, a little bit less of a team player. Maybe not quite as supportive of me as I was of him. But, that's you know, that's water under the bridge. I don't have a problem with it. Uh, Justin said uh, he was going to find me a, a small part in an upcoming film of his, and uh, I'm really looking forward to that. And, uh, yeah, I'll keep you updated if I find out any more, of course. How does that sound? Does that sound like a bandmate of his? Who is that? Which one of the NSYNC guys is that? Is that the uh, the bad boy? Or I don't know the other NSYNC people. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the other thing is when I'm campaigning and or president, I have to still make time to play. And it's going to be hard to play, right? It's like, I'm not going to be able to do this anymore and be a million people in there, you know? I can chat with anybody, basically. So, I don't know. I'm going to have to find my way to still play. That means, obviously, I'll have to play the guitar, make songs, and, and maybe make a little comedy thing or something. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe see if I can find some celebrities to come over and make a little video with me or something, some actor types or something, you know? Yes, I'm a young, I'm subject to yawn contagion. I, I'm much more subject to it than Rachel, who I've noted is only lightly subject to it. Purport, presumably, I don't know, I haven't asked this or tested it, but presumably ENFJs and ENTJs are immune to it, if my theory is correct. That ENFJs and ENTJs don't get yawn contagion. I do though. I get yawn contagion. Don't contagion your yawn, okay? Stop contagion your yawn is a good sentence. <laughs> I hate it when you contagion me with your yawn. Contagion isn't a verb, Eric. Okay? Me? I don't know when another male around me gets an erection. I, I, would, I mean, I'd have to be looking at their crotch, I guess. Um, I've never been in the habit of noting the status of other men's crotchal regions. Uh, the only time I might is if you occasionally see a gentleman who has, has, um, embraced the skinny jeans phenomenon. Have you seen those skinny jeans before? They're, they, it's not just for girls anymore. <laughs> they have skinny jeans for men. And they do. Now, if you are a human male and think for one second and have any sense at all, you're probably musing, but gosh, that sounds uncomfortable. <laughs> that sounds like, uh, Eddie, Bob, and Frank down there are going to maybe object to the tight quarters. I, I would I would say probably a sensible, sensible objection. Here's why. The only time I can recall noting another man's crotchal region is when uh, he was clad in skinny jeans. And... I thought that's a terrible fashion thing. I wish nobody had ever decided to make male skinny jeans. There's no reason for them. They're contraindicated by the laws of nature and physics. They would seem to place you at risk for genital injury, potentially. You know, you need, if you put your pressure over there, you need your your guys to have an escape route. If your genitals are a car and you're driving down the freeway, 
your genitals are cars exercising defensive driving techniques, which means they are leaving a, at least one car length space between themselves and all the cars around, one in front of them, one behind them, the ones to the side. They just keep those cars at length away from you and that keeps your car safe. Now imagine if you've willfully chosen to drive right in the center of a box full of moving cars. What happens if the car in front of you stops suddenly? Well, that's called painful genital syndrome. That's right. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the male genitals can be sensitive, especially in the testicular region. And pressure upon this region can result in quite a bit of discomfort. One may even go as far as say pain. Uh, and in the worst case scenarios, damage to that region could render a man less complete in his malehood, in theory. Uh, a fate no man wishes to endure. And so it is that I present today's affirmation. Namely, skinny jeans for men are bad. And I, re I will reiterate my contentions for you so you know what to vote on. Contention one. They look bad and they draw your attention to some place you don't want to be looking, really. Number two. They pose a comfort risk while wearing them because the constriction of the genital area is contraindicated by the comfort requirements of the genital area. Number three, they increase risk of hurt or injury to the genitals in the in the fashion of the box of moving cars, as I indicated. Right. I'm gonna throw one more one more out here just for fun, though. Number four, I bet they're hard to take on and put off, put, take off and put on. You know, they've got to be. Well, why, Eric? Because they don't just slide right off. They cling to your body like saran wrap. What would be easier to take off? A burlap sack or saran wrap wrapped around all your body? A burlap sack is easier to take off. That's the answer. If you, I wasn't even going to give you a chance to figure it out if you didn't know right away. Burlap sack is way easier to take off than having your whole lower body wrapped in saran wrap. Now, the exception to that might be, of course, if the burlap sack is cinched around your waist and locked close to that cinched position and cinched so tight that you can't pull it down over your hips. In that scenario, possibly it would take equivalent amount of time to get out of the saran wrap of the burlap sack. So in that scenario, my analogy would in fact be a poor analogy. But let's presume that scenario is not in the mix. Then my analogy is it stands and informs you well about what I'm saying. <laughs> that, that's called professional level bullshit. Just, just spewing random bullshit and trying to make it sound serious, you know. I think I'm pretty good at that. That's some professional level bullshitting right there. Fashionable turtleneck? Is there such a thing? Bieber haircut. Yeah. I do have, um, you know, I do have my better hair. This is my uh, formal hair for when I have an important occasion or something. All right. Let's come to order, please. It's ESTP Eric. And like a lot of ESPs, you know, I've kept my youthful good looks well into my 40s um tonight we're talking about panties uh, they have a crotch on the one hand we've got the camp that says crotchless panties are the way to go on the other hand those who prefer the crotch and the panties what are the arguments of each let's ask them okay so crotchless panties I'm gonna take that side and this douchebag intuitive over here is going to do crotch panties, all right? Okay, I got one argument for you. Bone. Easier to bone. No fabric. Game over. You go, retard. Uh, I'm not a retard. I mean, uh, intuitard. Thank you.
Rick Benson, I will go. Okay, first of all, may I say that your whole affect and manner is really offensive and misogynistic. Um, girls are for more than just boning. Okay, I agree. One of their purposes is boning. But that's not their primary purpose, nor certainly the only thing we should consider. Now, I want to point out that for us, even for you, I'm sure, Rick Benson, a sound majority of the day is not spent boning your girl. During that time period, though, her vagina may emit discharge, and you're going to want a panty with a crotch in it to catch that discharge so it doesn't get onto her pants and make her embarrassed in the middle of that staff meeting. Uh, all right, into chart. Listen, uh, one thing you got wrong there. As a matter of fact, my girl does spend the majority of her day taking the bone. Majority of today and every day. Rick Benson is like the butcher taking something to the dog out back. He's delivering the bone. All day, every day. Okay. All right. Oh, okay, Rick Benson. Okay, fine. So, you know, you heard it from Rick. The reality is, I guess he won the debate and crossless panties are better. I mean, I thought I won, but everybody voted for him, so that's fine. Whatever. People don't even get debate. I can't believe that he won that debate. I totally won, but whatever. It's fine. No, you think whatever you want. No, I'm not hurt. No, I'm not offended. No, I'm not a sore loser. I don't think I lost. Well, I know you all say I did, but I think you're wrong. Well, what did I lose on? Bone? You saying he outweighed me on the impacts? Alright, fine. He outweighed me on the impacts. Boning is more important. I was just pretending to... to, to try to win. Yeah, it's like I knew I was beat. As soon as he did his opening speech, I thought, there's no way I'm going to beat this guy. He really... Got some good N I there. Um, I believe it is spelled with a K. If I'm not mistaken. I don't think it's R I C Benson. Although I like that idea. But um yeah, Rick Benson I believe has a K in his name. He's an ESTP. He likes to surf, he likes to bone, he likes to run shit around here. Okay. He's got awesome hair. And uh, he's got a smooth style that the ladies find irresistible. So, Winston's mom. I hear you're single now. Now, listen, uh, why would you, uh, you're single, but you're you're hanging around here with a bunch of intuitards, right? Now, I think you know what you really need is ESCP. Okay? Because, you know, you're going to get any of these intuitards here, home, they are not going to know what to do with you. You don't got to worry about that with old Rick Benson. I know what to do with you. Bone. Mm -hmm. Ben Nicholas Watson how'd that advice I gave you work out you been that chick yeah yeah you tell her what I said remember it's in the pronunciations whatever like that just she's like hey and she goes like hey yeah <laughs> whatever and you just walk away. Just like that, alright? Give it a shot again. If it didn't work for you last time, try it again. Alright? 
CJET, I know you were having trouble with the ladies. Just practice it at home in the mirror if you got it or whatever. But just be like, you walk up, you're just like, hey. When she's like all head back, you just be like, whatever. Just like that. Whatever. Like that, okay? And then, what's the next thing that's going to happen? What's the next thing you find yourself doing? Burn. Burn. You're going to poke. Burn. You're going to burn and poke. Okay. First you're going to poke. Then you're going to burn. You're going to burn down. Balls deep. After that, you're going to go Lord of the Rings style on her and go hands deep. And she's going to be like, oh, eh, eh. You're going to be like, Ben. <laughs> ben. <laughs> Then, then you're gonna be like, oh, Ben. Hey, girl, listen. Ben. I'm gonna burn right now. You know what you need? The burn. So I gave it to her. I gave her the burn. And she was like, eh, eh. You so good, Vic Benson. It's like, yeah, I am. I slapped her on the ass. That's how you burn. That's how you poke, and that's how you burn. All right. Anybody want to join my symposium? How to burn. Intro level. In introduction to how to burn. All right. So, hi class. I'm Rick Benson. I want to welcome you all here to introduction on how to burn. Uh, some of you, a lot of you, probably have burned before. Some of you maybe haven't even ever been before. Regardless, in this class, we're going to show you how to burn, how to poke, how to slay. All right. Now, don't expect by the end of just this first class that you'll be able to slay yet. Okay. Slaying's down the road. Before you can slay, you need to know how to poke. Before you can poke, you need to learn how to burn. All right. Now, once you've mastered boning, poking, and you've accomplished slaying, then you will go back to boning. From that point forward, you're just going to be boning everyone. All right. Who's ready to learn how to bone down? All right. Cool. So, Jimmy, you look like uh, somebody who talks too much. Um, what's your problem? Are you here in this class? I'm here to learn how to bone, sir. <laughs> okay, Winston's mom, child care lady. Once upon a time, there was a wonderful, safe, and innocent child who did family friendly things. Why, well, first they went to the a local store that sold objects that children like to buy and they purchased several boy was the child delighted by this activity shortly thereafter they went to a store selling various foods of very sweet qualities made entirely of sugar almost yes they were candies and the small child selected some candies and she looked up and she said oh caregiver may I have some of these candies and the caregiver said why, of course you can. <laughs> Why, of course you can, little girl. And the little girl enjoyed her candies, and all was well. Then she said, I think I'm ready for a nap. And they went home, and the caregiver told her a story, and the little girl fell asleep and had sweet dreams, until later on, when she awoke only to want a snack. But you've just woken up, said the caregiver to the little girl. But I want a snack anyway. And the little girl received a snack, and she was pleased by the snack. After that, she watched cartoons. What cartoons would be on today, she wondered. Oh, it's my favorite, she said. What's your favorite, said the caregiver. Why, it's... Tom and Jerry. 
That's an old cartoon for you to like, <laughs> the caregiver. <laughs> yes, but I like it so much anyway. Tom and Jerry. I also like He-Man and the Defenders of the Universe. That's another one that I like. <laughs> I see, said the caregiver. And what did the little girl named Lolita share her candy with? The mailman? <laughs> no. The little girl didn't share her candy. She ate it all herself, of course. Like any intelligent little girl would. However, um, you know, like also like any, any respectable little girl, she enjoyed all the major cartoons. She liked the Flintstones. She liked Tom and Jerry. She liked Scooby-Doo. Uh, as far as reruns go, she liked, you know, um, Adam 12. She enjoyed Gilligan's Island. She uh, didn't really like Soap, which was a comedy, but was, in his mind, not very, her mind, not very funny. She liked certain game shows. She liked Family Feud, you know. She didn't like soap operas. And uh, she watched Voltron sometimes. That's another another cartoon she liked. Oh, wait, that's my childhood. My bad. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I've mistaken her childhood for mine. And can you visited the Genaxial channel yet? He has some very good music reviews. Oh, he does music reviews? Hmm. I still haven't visited his channel. I didn't mean to. I think I saw it once, but I didn't, I didn't really dig in, look at the video. I just sort of glanced at it. But I'll go check it out. Um, I'm tired. Thundercats, for sure. The little girl's a big Thundercats fan. Um, it seems like an odd time to go to sleep. I'm so sleepy now. What are my thoughts on the passing of time? I think that it passes as we sit in time. Uh, I mean, I think time is essentially a uh, particular subjective metric uh, that relates to the suitability of experience to our both nature and mood so that when an experience is highly suitable to your nature and you're in the right mood time passes very quickly if experience is insuitable to your nature or you're in a very bad mood, which you basically say you know, that could include your particular experiences, I'm being stabbed right now, well that's going to make it impossible for you to um, for you to chill out even if everything is else is great or whatever I don't know you can pull an answer out of your ass that question I'm going to ask questions that tend to to answer them. Uh, I've thought about time plenty. Um, I do think that well, it's interesting the way that our subjective understanding of time uh, is there and we also have an objective understanding of time which isn't an understanding of time so much as it is a uh, understanding that the motion of the sun around the earth is both predictable and constant like you know so then we can use that as a mechanism to create essentially chunks of universal time that we can all share and use communicatively even though none of us have anything but a particular experience of time so it's an interesting way it demonstrates the link between um objects and experience you know it's like uh, we we can have our experience of something we can each of us have an experience of something but we still can't communicate about it until we've rendered it into an object like this or that
one of those two. What are your thoughts on the offensive nature of time? I don't find time offensive. I don't think it's offensive or defensive or respectful or any of those things. I think it's, um, you know, I mean, the other thing I would say is it's important to remember when we're talking about time in the abstract as an object that we ought not mistake the reality that we can treat the future as an object for thinking that the future functions like an object. In other words, the future is one thing that we can name, describe, that doesn't exist. Definitionally, the future doesn't exist yet. Definitionally, we can know what the future is by knowing that statements about the future are predictive, not descriptive. Um, so, I guess what I'm getting at here is if you think about stuff like time travel, and we have a movie where somebody travels into the future. That is a way of making time into an object that misleads us about the nature of time. Whereas it doesn't necessarily mislead us to imagine we could travel back to the past because there's some notion among people that information like energy doesn't really get uh, destroyed once it's existent. So, uh, I gotta pee. What are your critiques of time as a cook? <laughs> time? <laughs> trying to get tickets to my boning symposium? That's not me, dude. That's Rick Benson. Boning symposium. Rick Benson's boning symposium. <laughs> Hi, ladies, and welcome to Rick Benson's boning symposium. Today, I'm going to be showing you how to burn. Well, more precisely, I'm going to be boning you. That's right. The teacher has become the student. Um, wait, wait, H how does that make you the student? Uh, I'll show you, just take off all your clothes and let's, let's begin the boning. Um, is this what other people expected? Did, did, did other people expect this? Is, that, is this how this is gonna play out? I did! Good, what's your name? Julie, great, come over here, let's show the others how we bone. Alright, first step of boning. You're gonna bend her over. Locate the vaginal, vaginal regions, okay? That's where you're gonna stick your bone. You know, Rick Rick Benson's boning symposium had such an amazing impact on me in my life. Before his bone symposium. I had low self esteem. I was worried a lot of times. Now I'm just filled with a new vibrant energy and I can't wait to go out and tackle my life again. Thanks for his big pants and bone symposium. <laughs> That's right. Here at Rick Benson's bone symposium, you too can learn how to bone. You might think, hey, I'm not really that good at boning. You're a candidate for Rick Benson's Boning Symposium. Send pictures. Okay, send pictures. I mean, you can send pictures of yourself in clothes, but uh, 
that's just making one more email when I have to request that you you uh, remedy that problem. So just go ahead and send nudes. Uh, if you are interested in joining Rick Benson's Bone Symposium, that means you are interested in learning to bone. And that means you're a hero. That's what all of humanity needs. My bone. Thanks, Rick Benson. Where can we get a hold of tickets to this Bone Symposium? Get on Ticketmaster or any of your local uh, Music Plus superstores are carrying the tickets as well. Plus, I should mention, if you bring in an empty Coke can, get a dollar off. That's wonderful. How much are they? $1,200. That's $11.99 for the Coke can. Man, I was really hoping to go to Rick Benson's Pony Symposium this year, but I just can't afford it. Things have gotten outrageous. <laughs> have you ever applied before? No. I don't think he'd take you. I'm pretty sure he only takes chicks. What? It says here, Pony Symposium, all welcome to apply. Right, all of them to apply. He's not discriminating you in the application. Oh, how do you know? Well, I, I attended the symposium last year. Maria, we were dating last year. Well, yeah, we, well, we weren't committed yet. What do you mean? I already asked you to marry me. Well, that's why I wanted to learn how to bone. I thought you boned fine. Like you didn't, honey. That's why I went to Rick Benson's Bone Symposium. I would have signed you up, but he doesn't take men. Oh, that makes sense, I guess. <laughs> Wait, I don't go well? <laughs> no, honey. I didn't want to hurt your feelings, but, uh... You're like a dead fish. In what regard? Your eyes are all glassed over. Well, I don't know, it just turns me off. Glossy eyes have always turned me off. I think, oh, he's dead. Every time I'm having sex with you. But I'm not dead. I know, sweetie, but you kind of made me dead, inside. So, I've got tickets again this year for Rick Benson and Tony's Symposium. Um, hopefully you'll have moved out by the time I return. Damn that Rick Benson. I'm gonna get him. Oh, Rick Benson. You're always causing trouble. Must be that SE. Turns you into a hero. Yeah, I'm a hero. And it's like, if there's a fire, I save everything and then I burn everyone. Pretty heroic. But you save first and then you burn? Well, yeah, you know. But it plays well. <laughs> How can it never have you, Rick Benson? You know that old Willie Nelson song? You gotta know when to bone them. You gotta know when to bone them again. And then you gotta know when to jet, you know, dog? Because you gotta know when to bone them. Know when to poke them. Know when to walk away. Know when to come back and bone. You gotta know when to bone them. You let all your foes on. Put it in your bone now, it's just bone, bone, bone. <laughs> Rick 
things in professional bone coach. I coach people on how to bone. Yeah. Well, I'm an expert. You should see me bone. It's like a work of art. You know, you're just standing here and about to pee. It's like, damn. I bet that guy could bone. You'd win that bet. Why do I ever let Rick Benson come over? I don't know. He's so offensive and rude. He's such a, like, censor, you know? Oh, he's talking about boning and poking. Saving people from fires. Don't forget punching in two tarts in the face. Oh, yeah. I forgot. My bad. Alright, you're not a bone coach. <sighs> That's true, Rick Benson. You look like you could use a bone coach. What, are you uh, offering your services? No, I only coach women. Thanks, Rick. Uh, and, uh, really just wondered for a man. How about If you'd like, I can coach a girl. No, thanks, Rick. Um, uh, Rachel and I, Rachel, wait, look, actually she might still already be on my list, uh, Papalosa, yeah, she signed up for the Bone Symposium, what, oh yeah, hey, don't blame her dog, it's not your fault, you know, Rick Benson, <laughs> the bank water bully has stolen my woman, emasculated me, Made me feel ashamed of myself. I'll never recover. Boo! 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 That's crying. That's what crying sounds like. So, you know, you got your crying. Boo! You got your laughing. Ha 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 ha. You got your worrying. Fresh, 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 fresh. You got your scared. Ah! Um, you've got your surprise. And what sound goes with um, melancholy? Oh, that's that's like sorry for you. So sorry for you. Um. I want to spend... A, yes, Octavia Silva. Yes. You've written my name in all capital letters. That means it's important. Stop everything. Octavia's got an emergency. <laughs> what time is it? What time is it at? Let me look at my calendar. Do I have something this morning or what? Calendar. It's not till... I don't see anything on my calendar for today until 6 o'clock. I got a makeup session. I missed yesterday because I was sleeping. I got up. I got in here ten minutes late, and I was just too asleep. I was just like, I gotta reschedule this. And then I got a nine p.m. tonight. I don't see anything else on my schedule. Is there something else on my supposed to be on my schedule today, Octavio? Did I not put something in my calendar? Oh, you're the reschedule. Okay, yeah, I've got you down. I got you down on my calendar. All right, cool. Nathan Glass. You mean who who's Nathan Glass? My bad about that. I was just it's like you didn't want me at that point, believe me. Uh, 
if I'm if I'm low energy enough, <laughs> you know, it's just like you don't want that. You want you want Eric, who's who's got some vim and vigor. Uh, that guy. Um, yeah, I've listened to a little bit of his stuff. Uh, he's a good piano player. Very good piano player. Oh yeah, I'll put out. Don't worry. Anyone takes me to dinner, I put out. First date. No questions asked. You buy me a burger, I figure I owe it to you. Well, I really hate him, but he did buy me a burger, so... Okay. I bend over. It's just the, the reality of the world, unfortunately. That's how it is for everybody, until and unless they go to Rick Benson's Bone Symposium. He's been declared Bone Coach of the Year by the International Bone Coach Association. Three years running. Granted, the association is an organization of his own making, and he is the CEO and sole member of the organization. But still, that's a pretty good set of awards for somebody who's been in the bone coaching business for only three years, already won three times. And, uh, you know, his website is full of dazzling testimonials as the power of his bone coaching symposium to open new doors in the realm of boning. <laughs> that's not me, man. That's not me. That's Rick Benson. I, I'm, I'm in your boat. Rick Benson stole my girl. Did you hear him say that Rachel has signed up for his bone symposium? It's like, okay, ESTP is just, can you stop, please? We we get, why are you the only one who gets women, you know? Can't an ENTP have one just for a keeper without you coming and stealing her way to your bone symposium to make him feel bad about himself? For God's sakes. Well, thanks, Grooming Zone. I appreciate it. Eric reminds me of mortality. People do die. But not today. None of us are going to die today. You know why? We got stuff to do. Because of the love in our hearts. If you've got enough love in your heart, today's never the day that you die until it is, which is a long time from now. A southern colloquialism for Vim Vigor or Gumption. A man who stood firm in the face of adversity was said to have. Spizzerinctum? Spizzerinctum. Not a single person in the world, what? Abraham Lincoln? Was he the first bone coach? <laughs> After writing the Emancipation Proclamation, Benjamin, I mean, uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, held his first bone symposium class. Uh. He had Mary Todd there. And, uh, that was it. But later sessions included all the hottest ladies of the Civil War era. Your Betsy Ross. <laughs> your, your, uh, <laughs> your lady who wrote, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, what person I thought was Abraham Lincoln? I suspect Abraham Lincoln was probably an INTP. So I think government mandated girlfriends. Well, um, you know, I think the government is more likely, they like to mandate training sessions. So they're probably going to more likely require everyone's girlfriends to take Rick Benson's Bone Symposium. Yeah, it was. I know. I forget her name. Ha wait, Harriet Be Beatrice Stowe? Is that her name? Harriet, Harriet Beatrice Stowe, maybe? Um, you know. 
he said that uh, Willa Cather was a hot piece of ass, apparently. Is, is that Civil War era? I'm in trouble, I'm in trouble thinking of Civil War era women, for reference. Yeah, he was a lawyer at first. Uh, I think Lincoln, I mean, you know, it's, I would not put that out of the possibility, out of the realm of possibility, Green Zone. He could have been an INFP because um, INFPs can have very good TI. And additionally, he was subject to lots of fits of melancholy, which would seem to be more consistent with INFP than with uh, INTP. Um, hard to say. I can't really interview him because I keep getting distracted by the stove top hat. It interferes with my concentration. I ask him to take it off. He says, it's my thing. So you know I'm Abe Lincoln. Good point. Did I act any differently in middle school than I do now? Yeah, I, I was... I mean, for one thing, in middle school, I, I remember spending a great deal of time uh, sneaking moments to read my fiction books. I'd always take them to school with me. It wasn't like I was trying to avoid things or like I needed to entertain myself because I had no friends or something. It's that I wanted to read these books. I was into them. You know, it's like I was into what was going on in the story. I was not into what they were saying in class and school. I was always trying to um, read under my desk and a lot of times reading at recess and stuff. Sometimes like being hanging out with my friends and then sneaking like to turn this way so I could read my book a little bit and then my like friends busting me, you know. So I in my middle school years I guess you you might say I was more introverted, but really I was just really into reading fantasy books. Um I also, you know, experienced some, some both negative and positive moments regarding bullying in middle school, both being bullied, be a, being a bully, and resisting bullies. I experienced all those things in middle school. Um, I had kind of a, uh, a moment of triumph at one point in middle school where this guy who was who had been making some attempts to bully me was standing in front of my locker trying and not letting me get um, get to my locker, you know, and uh, I just, I don't know, I just, I, I guess I was too mad. I, at that point, I had, had enough bullshit or whatever room. I reached out and I grabbed him by the throat and pushed it against the locker and choked the shit out of him. So a teacher came by and told him to stop. Well, he never bothered me again. No, Kyra. There's nothing sinful about your particular um, predilection. I was like seventh grade. Um, you know, it, when I grew up, there was very little supervision of children and. The reason I wasn't fully bullied was because I did what one had to do, which was period. It's you know stand up for oneself at one point, have the fist fight, um, be the aggressor, or whatever you know something like that to establish that you won't simply continue to be a victim. That's what the social system required of all males when I grew up. There was no protection from any adults. No adults protected anybody. Um, he did he did some in elementary school, which I largely ignored. His guidance tended to be, here's how you here's how you use physical violence more effectively. Like, like show me how to punch and stuff like that, you know. Um, which I didn't use because I don't know. It just seemed. I didn't know what to think about it. Um, when I was in, by the time I was in middle school, though, I understood the dynamics by that point. That there was no 
There was nowhere to turn but to yourself in regards to these things. It was not possible for me to uh, get help from my parents. You know, I mean, if, if a specific situation was bad enough or something like that, they might be able to talk to that person's parents or something, but it's it was not possible for me to remedy this any sort of bullying situation in general by for, by talking to my parents or teachers or friends or anything else. It was a simple matter of the dynamics of boys unsupervised that were compelled to be together in a location where none of them were consensually, namely school. And that dynamic was as follows. Everybody gets tested to see if they'll be a victim. If they will, they'll be victimized until they stop it. Until they reveal that they will not be a victim. And the way you not be a victim is you fight. And it doesn't matter if you win or lose. It, once you've had the fight, you're not bullied anymore because you demonstrated you won't be a victim. And that was the simple cutthroat dynamics of my neighborhood. It was very much Lord of the Flies around here. No, I was in a co-ed school, but this is Arcadia, and um, when I went to school here, it was very much a old school, like, like, it was a manifestation of all the awfulness. There, you know, there were, it was like Mean Girls, and... You know, there were the popular kids, and there were the victims, and there were, it was just, it was cutthroat. It was uh, rich kids, some of whom were pretty and pretty girls, and they were popular, and some of whom were guys who were good at sports, and they were popular. And then there were various cliques and groups and stuff, but uh, it, it was not an economy that was friendly to intuitives let's put it that way so the thing is uh, it didn't hurt me that bad because I was an unusual intuitive in a lot of ways it, one thing that helped me was I so didn't fit into um, I said it didn't fit into the normal taxonomy that the social system used that it was difficult for people to position me or know know what to do with me. I was extroverted and forward by high school anyway in a way that the victims weren't um, but I was also effy rough in a way that normally would entice bullying and I was also kind of combative in a way that would suggest I'm not easily victimized but then I also was could be surprisingly like absent-minded naive in ways that made it seem like I was so you know people I got a little bit of a little bit of bullying here here and there maybe in high school but mostly in high school I had my group of people that I hung out with which were what you might call like the bohemians or something and um, and we you know we had, had our own thing going on and we didn't really do school stuff very much so anyway but I, despite that fact despite the fact that I was not uh, at the bottom of the pecking order that I didn't suffer a great deal of brutalizing I certainly emerged from my high school years convinced that um, I was not reproductively viable, that, um, that, you know, I was not one of the class of people who would be able to date because that's a sort of, of message that's made very loud and clear to you back in the day in school by by various parties that attempt to um, to you know I guess you'd say annex bits of the ontology of people as a manner of victimizing them which function is used to say things concisely NI or TI NI TI is not necessarily concise 
Am I a fan of Bonology? Uh, well, you know, I've heard a lot about the field from Rick Benson. He likes to talk about it a lot. And, uh, you know, as a bone coach, he's an expert, I would assume. Um, so, I've heard from him a couple of key key things. I can share a couple of, of tips that he shared with me. Uh, tip number one. When you're with a beautiful lady and the lights go out, it's time to bone. I've heard this as a rule. I'm not, I, I haven't tested any of these rules. These are just things Rick, Rick has told me. Number two, uh, if you're going to bone right, use your bone. So this one's actually been a really practical use for me because uh, until recently, I would try to bone with elbows, knees, uh, ankles, uh, with limited success, and I couldn't figure out what I was doing wrong, but, uh, you know, I swallowed my pride and said, Rick, am I doing something wrong here? You're the bone coach. He said, Eric, make sure you're using your bone. I mean, he didn't say it like that. He said, you gotta use your bone. You know, boner with your bone, dog. Duh. So after that, it was like a light bulb. It was like, oh, aha. So that's why it's changing, elongating, becoming more firm, um, you know, rising in a vertical direction instead of hanging limply. These things I thought were incidental occurrences. Turns out it's integral to the act itself. Um, so, you know, I told Rachel, hey, I guess I might want to try. Hopefully later today, maybe we're going to try it. Uh, it seems crazy because obviously that's your private area. You don't want to, it's kind of, you know, it's like, it's, that's where I pee from. Like, why would I put that in there? But um, I'm hopeful that it's even better than elbow, knee, or ankle size. So I'm hoping. We'll see. Would a skeleton take a bone coach to the ball? Would a skeleton wear glass slippers or need some other kind of shoe to lose at midnight so the skeleton parents could find it? Well, I would suggest that the, uh, the skeleton goes to the bone ball. Um, she'd probably just leave her pelvic bone. That's, that's a clear symbol among skeletons that you're DTF. <laughs> if you leave your pelvic bone by someone's door. Write your name on it. It can be easy to confuse with other pelvic bones. Jenny. And you just put it by, by by the prince's door and he'll go. What's this? Is that is that your pelvis or are you just happy to see me? And then he's gonna break the bad news to her. I got some bad news. I am the bone prince, but being a skeleton means well, see Ironically, the one thing that's not a bone is my bone. So we're kind of out of luck here. I don't know what we're going to do. You want to try ankle, knee, or elbow sex? Pretty satisfying. You know, sort of, I guess. It's better than nothing. Today, we're going to discuss the dangers of dry humping. Don't dry hump. You might chafe yourself. You had brunch with Teal Swan yesterday. Okay. Were there bottomless mimosas? If not, it doesn't qualify as brunch. It's just lunch with omelets. Okay, here's another reason not to dry hump. Clothes wrinkling. 
you want to wrinkle your clothes that badly? No. There's chafing. There's clothes wrinkling. There's a uh, risk of wet hump. What if something falls out and anything falls out and all of a sudden you're wet humping? You know. We can't risk that. We can't risk anybody dry humping on mower's cousin. Okay. Is that me? No, nobody can try on one more cousin. <coughs> Except me and I don't want it. Okay, that means nobody. <coughs> Wait, what's your cousin look like? I just like it. I don't want to try hump your cousin. I really don't want to try hump anybody. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I knew that long more. I knew you meant that it was you and not me dry humping your cousin. She told me. It was really embarrassing, she said. She couldn't believe it. You were dry humping her. And she was like, haven't you heard about the risks? Chafing? Clothes wrinkling? Accidental wet humping? And Lawn Mower said, I stand corrected. And then Jesus showed up and said, hey, 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 Lawn Mower. <laughs> Watch out here. Come on. That counts as fornication, don't you know? Well, you know what another word for dry humping is, don't you? Dry fornication. Or in other words, the devil's toast, they call it. The devil's unbuttered toast. <laughs> the devil's toast. Dry humping is uh, the devil's toast. You have any viable cousins? Do you mean cousins that are eligible for you to dry hump? Or do you mean uh, you don't have any cousins who uh, are not sterile? I mean, another, another meaning of saying you don't have any viable cousins. None of my cousins are, are able to bear children. They're all sterile. None of them are viable reproductively. Aw, one more has all sterile cousins. How sad. Retracted with authority. Do you also want to explain the chafing is actually caused by actuary energy and high fructose corn syrup? Well, that's no surprise there. I mean, high fructose corn syrup is responsible for all kinds of things. Responsible for uh, erratic moods, for, for elation, for melancholy. It's responsible for an even temper. It's responsible for anxiety and overconfidence. And the worst thing is high fructose corn syrup can cause all of those symptoms to be concurrent. Which is pretty tough to consider the kind of symptoms that it causes. You know, Bill Burkett, she also wanted to say something to me about your energy vibrations, I believe. I think she was saying you're vibrating at 445 as a frequency and in the color of yellow. That's what Teal has to say to you. I am her medium today. A medium for Teal Spawn. Just as other mediums, I talk to the dead. The difference is I talk to those who are spiritually dead, not physically dead. Teal come to me. I'm here. I'm your medium. I'm talking to you. Oh, spiritually dead one. Reveal your thoughts to me. Sorry, physically dead. I only deal with the spiritually dead. Some emotionally dead, sure. I try to avoid the intellectually dead and physically dead. Come speak to you. Come. Yes, there's your hollow spiritual shell. Tell me more of your lies. <laughs> I'm <laughs> dry up in my third eye, indeed. <laughs> I'm a medium. <sighs> I do talk to dead people, but only living emotionally dead people. Um, and I need to actually have a face-to-face -face conversation with them. It's not like magic or anything, but it does qualify as being a medium. So if someone in your life seems unnecessarily cold or unresponsive, and you'd like to hire me for my medium skills, I can ask them why. Cost four hundred dollars for the first forty-five minute session, and 
you are required to book a second 30 minute session which is only $200 after that I'll tell you why exactly your significant other seems emotionally dead to you it's possibly because he was born with no emotions but I won't know until after the two sessions Okay, I'm handing out free diagnoses today. Uh, Curious Kyra, you get to be, let's see, antisocial personality disorder. Um, Genexial, I'm giving you attention deficit disorder. Bill Burkett, you got oppositional defiant disorder. Nathan Long, I'm sorry to tell you, you got borderline personality disorder. Uh, Alan Bryan, Holla. You're just in time to get a diagnosis. Um, Brian, you've got um, schizophrenia. Lawnmower, I'm giving you bipolar mania. We're, we're, I'm handing out mental diseases to everybody. Everybody gets a diagnosis today, a label. Okay. Um, so that we can better dismiss your experience as a pathological problem rather than just being different than me. You see, like most psychology minded people, I understand psychology well. I understand that healthy means being like me. And to the extent that you deviate from me, well, there's something wrong with you. But the good news is, I'm qualified by all licenses all the time. I'm licensed to issue a diagnosis to each of you um, uh, according to my, my instincts. Uh, um, Brian, I'm going to give you an additional uh, thyroid problem. So you've got a thyroid problem, plus um, you're prone towards delusions of grandeur. Sorry to tell you, it's going to take some work with the therapist. No, I didn't, Gen X. I gave you ADHD. Okay, pay attention to the details. My, my diagnosis is proved right. Um, who wants ODD? Oppositional Defiant Disorder. That's a fun one. That means you're not doing anything wrong, but you disagree with the psychologist. Then you have Oppositional Defiant Disorder. That's how you get it. You, you catch it by disagreeing with the professional. Um, I could also possibly give schizoid to somebody if somebody wants schizoid. Uh, I could give uh, a specific excessive ontological angst. That's my own diagnosis. I used to, you know, for anybody who seems different than me, but I can't nail down something specifically wrong with them. They just they just get that. Yeah, you need to get your ovaries removed. Is right uh, right away. After you get your ovaries removed, I'd like you to have them take your ovaries and replace your tonsils with those ovaries. That's the only way you can be sure you're going to be safe. You want mirror touch synesthesia? Makes people feel what other people are feeling? No, you can't have that. No, that's not a disease. You can have alcoholism. <laughs> okay, Winston's mom, you get alcoholism. Listen, everybody, I don't want you to drink around Winston's mom. She's our alcoholic. She has a problem with that. Uh, you know, uh, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna add you a disease to Genexial so we can worry about you a little bit more. I'm gonna give you OC, OCD. You have obsessive compulsive disorder, and your specific problem: light switches and doorknobs. You need to check every doorknob three times, every light switch three times. It's really annoying. I tell you to stop. You just keep doing it. Okay, Flying Fox 32, what's your mental disease? I'm handing out pathologies today. Uh, Flying Fox, you have, um, you have dyslexia. That's what's wrong with you. You're dyslexic, and you've got a bad attitude. <laughs> what do you need to get better? Well, what you need to be cured of antisocial personality disorder is uh, probably 
you know, years, years of cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, knowing your predilections, I'll see if I can find you a particularly uh, dogmatic, stern, and patronizing therapist who believes in corporal punishment, okay? I suspect that will help you with your antisocial personality disorder, knowing your predilections. Um, yes, I will cure you today of your disease. You're schizotypal now, Angantir, until you get my cure. I just cured Kyra by getting her um, a uh, a sadistic ENTJ therapist who believes in paddling to uh, to to get the antisocial personality disorder out of Kyra. The message was for me. Hey, hey, hey! Are you licensed by all licenses all the time to arbitrarily assign diagnoses? No, I am. Um. No, nope, Freddy for you gotta, I'm arbitrarily giving you a, a, a label, and that's what you are from now on. Your autism spectrum. Okay, used to be called Asperger's, not called that anymore. You're just spectrum. You're on the spectrum. Sorry, you are now. But I'm going to cure you in the process today. I'm not just handing out. Why are you. What is, how could Furious Flying Fox be in trouble already? She just said hello. Why are you shaming her immediately? Oh, she said, hello. Oh, lovely. Oh, she said, oh, lovely. Oh, my God, are we giving out diseases? Yes, we are. You get one, too. You can have chlamydia. <laughs> you like chlamydia? <laughs> Flying fox gets a bonus disease of chlamydia. <laughs> um, Angantir, uh, you take care of that gout. Before it takes care of you. Okay? Everybody stay away from Flying Fox. Uh, she has metaphysical chlamydia. The good news is all of these diseases are just the metaphysical forms. Um, which means they uh, don't require a whole lot of work to uh, cure. You only need metaphysical antibiotics. Hi, Kate from Type Match. I'm looking forward to our collab too. What are we going to be doing? I don't even know what we're doing. I guess we'll make a video or something, huh? We can make a video about. I know. How about typology? <laughs> something typology related. We could do that. Um, You know, what's a, would you like, oh, I'm handing out diseases type match. Uh, I'm giving people a diagnosis today to explain everything that's wrong with them. I'm going to give you a uh, scurvy. You have scurvy type match. That's why, whatever problems you have in life, now you know. The answer is, oh, it's because of my scurvy. Okay. We can interview each other. Okay, cool. I'm down to interview. I'm down to be interviewed. Sky gear? No, you don't have diarrhea. You have African sleeping sickness. That's kind of a rough one. I think it's fatal. Um, fortunately, I have some European waking pills that will cure your African sleeping sickness. Well, not so much cure as colonialize it. <laughs> You know, basically, these European wakefulness pills, they come in and they set up a farm on top of the African sleeping sickness. Of course, one of the big problems with getting African sleeping sickness is when you're sleeping with African sleeping sickness, it attracts a lot of large flies to land on you. And if you have it in Africa, of course, the reason you always see flies on people in Africa is because um, they haven't invented fly swatter technology yet. 
So, uh, I've often posited that one could make a lot of money opening a fly swatter factory in Africa because it's pretty obvious that that's a need that's not being met. A lawnmower needs a personality disorder? Okay. He can have personality personality disorder. It's the disorder where you constantly think everything is your personality, even when it's not part of you at all. Hey, look at that dog over there. Someone else. You go, That's just my personality. Uh, the point. No, it's not. But um, that's why it's a disease because you can't see that. Scary indeed. Scary indeed. Um, CJ O'Connell, I've got some really, really bad news for you. Well, okay, I've got some good news and some bad news. So, we've determined that your tumor is totally benign. It's not going to hurt you. It's not going to grow anymore. Unfortunately, you may want to go with a euthanasia anyway because the way this tumor is placed. It explains why you like the Dave Matthews band now. And it's likely that as the as the tumor's effects continue to manifest, you may begin liking Kings of Leon as well. So I wanna just remind you this is Oregon. We do have a compassionate care law. And if um you'd rather be put down than have to endure Dave Matthews and Kings of Leon, I don't think anybody would, would blame you for that. Swamp butt. Is it a personality trait? Hmm. I'm going to say no, because an element of the self that does not remain the same throughout one's life. Even if it's mostly a constant, there should be at least a brief moment after a bath in which your butt had not yet attained its swampish status. Yeah, swamp butt is another word for don't take a bath. You mad, bro? You trying to make me mad, bro? We all know that the Dave Matthews Band was sent on sent to Earth by the devil to force bad aesthetics on people and confuse people with poor aesthetic sense about what's worth listening to. It was also sent them to Earth to torture anybody with any good music sense because they might occasionally have to hear it. And obviously that you know, the more clearly you understand what's good, the more likely you are to vomit blood when you hear the Dave Matthews Band. Uh, if you hear them back to back with Kings of Leon, it could seriously put you in the hospital. I mean, because that much horrible music is not something anybody should have to endure. So just to be clear, I have set a world proclamation that the Dave Matthews Band is horrible. And so you should all just get up on the stepladder and sign my proclamation. We understand. I agree. I used to think I liked them, but now I've learned better. Okay? Um, right now, I have to go to bed. I am about to fall asleep, and I have stuff to do today, which means I need to sleep first. I'm out of cigarettes. I'm pretty much out of weed, which means... I need to sleep through until I can get weed again, which means I have to wait for the weed store to open. Who doesn't have TP? Swamp butt. Alright, so I'm going to leave you today with the following important reminder. Rick Benson asked me to remind you. Alright, into tards. Listen up. I want you to have a day away from your computers and don't forget to bone. Alright? Kyra, I'll see you at the Bone Symposium later. Kyra's a regular participant in the Bone Symposium, let me tell you. Alright. Catch you on the flip flop, y'all. Rick Benson out. Out.